Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everyone here this morning. If you're new, I want to take a second to welcome you. Um, we'd love to get to know a little bit more about you. We have a welcome desk out to the left. We'd love to stay in touch. Welcome to those also watching online. <laughs> have a few different announcements this morning. One from Women on Mission. They are planning a parents' night out on Friday, August 19th here at the church. It'll be 5.30 to 8.30. Um, if you're interested, please, we need you to sign up by Wednesday the 17th. Um, just call the church office. Um, we're going to be planning pizza that night uh, for the kids. So if that is something you're interested, that is Friday, August 19th from 5.30 to 8.30. Today we are going to be having a love offering um, for the Eastern Kentucky flood victims. There will be little envelopes in front of you in the pews um, for helping categorize where the money goes. If you can please put the money in those little yellow envelopes. Uh, something exciting, uh, next Sunday we're going to be our third through fifth Sunday school class for the kids is going to be starting. So a huge thank you to those who have stepped up to help lead. Um, we're very excited that that class is going to be starting up again uh, next Sunday. Our sports and banquet, um, the tickets you are also able to get in the back as of today. They are officially on sale. If you're not able to pick them up today, um, just call the office sometime this week and we can um, get you those tickets. Our verse today um, comes out of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's stand and worship them together. Thank you, Ryan. We are delighted that you're here today at Enterprise Baptist Church to worship with us. And we know that God's Spirit is among us because you're here. He's living in your heart. So let's worship together as we sing, We Have Come Into His House.
lamb that's been eating here today, to be called by you, to sing praises to your name, to worship you. As we prepare ourselves to hear the message that you've brought, we want to thank you to minister to us, prepare us for the week in which we are faced, Lord, that you bathe us with your Holy Spirit so that we might get through. And help us to share the news that you give us today with everybody that you put in our path. We want to thank you, Lord, and praise your name for this wonderful message. As we prepare to take up this love offering, Lord, we thank you for the blessings you bestowed upon us. We ask that you would set this offering with the love that is what you have given. For us in your precious and holy Son's name, we thank you, pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Teresa. That was beautiful. Change my heart, oh God. I know that uh, many of you have been praying for Teresa and her journey and, and episodes of treatment for her uh, illness. Well, I just want to ask the church, the body of Christ, to particularly pray for her this week as she goes for more scans. And I invite your prayers and supplications for Teresa and her health. We just know God will be glorified through her life and has already been. This morning I have a song I want to do for our commissioning team I'd like to sing. We're going to uh, embark on a, a trip to uh, Waterford, Michigan to help with a, a new church that's being planted there. And it's a, it's a privilege to go and to be a part of God's work going on in loca locations like that. Recently I, was able, I had the opportunity and privilege to go with the team to Ecuador and what a wonderful experience that was. And I realize that that team will be making a report soon, but I think, I think about Michelle Isles, who uh, we were uh, at Ecuador, and she had a 
wanted to Bible studies one night, and she wanted us to sing this little light of mine. And we're carrying our light everywhere to uh, to be a witness to God, uh, on, on uh, to God's kingdom, or places like that. You know, we want to be a, we want to be a witness where we are here in our own communities. Last year, uh, my father-in-law, Lyman Chipley, had a uh, about with some bad health issues and he ended up passing away in January. But Linda, my wife and I had the opportunity to witness to him, to share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now at 80, 87 years old, on his birthday, Linda and I prayed with her father and he invited Jesus to come into his heart on that day. Amen. And we glorify the fact that God took us, used us to be a witness to her dad. And he is now in heaven waiting for us and glorifying the Lord. And this morning, the song I'd like to sing is called Go Light Your World. And I pray that it will bless you and encourage you to be a witness wherever you are and take the opportunities to go out and uh, share God's love with others. There is a candle in every soul, some brightly burning, some dark and cold. There is a spirit who breathes a fire, ignites that candle, and makes his home. Take your candle, go like your world. 
Lord, you alone are God, and there is no other. You alone are holy. You alone are good. You alone are eternal. You alone have all power. And Lord, I know that we are all sinners, and none of us deserve you. We never have, and we never will. We all went our own way. But Jesus, we also know that you left heaven and came to earth and laid down your life willingly to take the punishment for our sins on yourself so that that could be finished. Just as you said on the cross, it's over and done. There's no more punishment to be handed out. You took it all for all of us. And we're so grateful. And Jesus, you told us that you are the light of the world. You're the one who can light the candles that Brady just sang about. None of us are truly alive without you. You told us that we must be born again. We must be born from above, from you. And Lord, we thank you for doing all of this for us. Thank you for walking with us daily. Thank you for leaving us your word to read. And help us to remember, Lord, that the words that you gave us, as you said, are spirit and they are life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for reminding us that your yoke is easy and your burden is light, that you'll give us rest if we just come to you. And Lord, there are many sick among us. And I pray that you heal them all, just as you heal so many while you walk this earth. So many times we read in the Bible how you have compassion on them all and heal all their sick. I pray that you do that for the sick among us. Yeah. And I pray, Lord, that you help Chris as he comes to the pulpit to deliver your word. Empower him, Lord, to deliver your word to us, as he always does, unashamedly, boldly, without watering it down. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would like to go to Children's Church, you are free to go now. Thank you, Brady and John, for that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 2. Somebody does not want to go to children's church. <laughs> James chapter 2. Looking at uh, verses 14 through 26, uh, as, uh, James was right here uh, dealing with uh, th these two subjects and how they go uh, hand in hand, uh, faith and works. And, and a lot of times we kind of lean one way or lean another when it comes to uh, salvation. I, I know that we have some denominations that are very work-based, that you can work your way up, you can earn. It's unbiblical. But, but then we, we can't lean fully all on this because James is going to say that these two entities, faith and and works, they, they go hand in hand. Now, now I want to open by saying this, that, that, that faith is the beginning of salvation. You, you, you come to know Christ by faith through him. But then the works is the evidence of your salvation. That because of what you do and how you live your life and the works that you do, it points back to where your faith is. See, in the Baptist church and in churches, we get this wrong because here, here's what we do when somebody comes to us and they ask, hey, hey, what do I need to do to be saved? We're bad about giving people a list of ten things to do to get saved. Here's, what they, here's the first thing we say. Well, you need to go talk to the preacher. The first thing we say. Second thing is, well, you, you need to come down front and you need to tell the church you want to be saved. And, and the third thing is you need to join the church. And, and the fourth thing is you need to get baptized. And the fifth thing is you need to go sit in the pew and stay there for the rest of your life. That's <laughs> what we do. We, we give a list of things that people can do, and that's unbiblical too. Because Jesus was approached by this question with the rich young ruler who asked, what, what must I do to earn salvation? Jesus' response was what our response should be. There's nothing you can do because it's all been done at Calvary. Amen. Praise God. That it's not based on your abilities. It's not based on your uh, resume. It's not based on your works, but it's based on the work of the Holy uh, God by sending his one and only son to die on a cross for us, paying a payment you can never pay so that you can have salvation. Praise God. 
that it's not dependent on Chris and it's not dependent on John and it's not dependent on anybody else in this world except Jesus Christ. Amen. Because if it was dependent on us, as, as Ryan read there in Ephesians 2 when Paul addresses the same situation, he says it's not by works because if it was by works, we would boast about our works. It's by faith through grace that we're saved and it's not by us because we can't brag about it because we didn't do anything to earn it. But when you get saved, James is tying these two together in this section by saying, when you get saved, a result of your faith is you want to do works. Here, here's something that, that we can dig into as James is writing and trying to encourage us to become believers, mature believers. That when you get saved and the more that you fall in love with Jesus, the minds, your mindset begins to change. Here, here's what I mean. You no longer use these terms. Well, I got to get up this morning. And I got to go to church. No, when you become a mature believer, here's what you realize. It's Sunday and I get to go to church with my brothers and my sisters. I get to go worship a holy and righteous God, even though I am a dirty, rotten sinner. And I get to have a relationship because of what his son did for me on the cross. See, when you mature in your faith, and you begin to realize who God is and who you are, your, your mindset begins to change that no longer do you have to do these things, but it's that you get to do these things. You get to serve a holy and righteous God, along with brothers and sisters that are just as dirty and rotten as you are, and you're only saved by the grace of God. And so James is tying these two entities together and to say that, that because of your faith, you're going to do works. And he says, if you don't, here's the problem. Your faith is dead. And I would dare to say boldly that there are a lot of people in the church this morning, not just here, but all over this land, all over the world, that have dead faith. That they, that they, they believe these things, but they're not going to do anything as a result of it. That they've been lied to by the church that all you have to do is sign a card, get baptized, and, and you just sit on your blessed assurance for the rest of your life. And when you die, you're going to get to heaven and Jesus is going to rejoice. It's not true. James is saying because of your faith, you're going to want to do works. You're going to want to be a part. Because the works are a result of your salvation. Amen. Not based on your salvation. So James 2, uh, 14 through 26. If you'll stand with me as we read from God. The Bible says this. What good is it, my brother? Someone says he has faith, but does not have works. And his faith saves him. If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, one of you says to, to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat well. But you don't give them what the body needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith, in the same way, faith, if it, it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you your faith, your, your faith from my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without work is you? <coughs> Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him for righteousness. He was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. And in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messenger? And sent them out by a different route. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, also faith without works is dead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. Lord, for your word and the power that it has. God, we thank you that your word is alive and active. That it pierces through. Lord, even when we don't want to hear the truth that we're thankful is reliable. That it is inerrant. It is holy. God, we're thankful for your love and your grace and your mercy that you give us every single day. We don't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. 
And God, we're thankful that you give it to us. Lord, we're thankful that in our helpless estate, that you would love us enough to send your one and only son to die on a cross for us and pay a payment we couldn't pay. And thank goodness the story doesn't end there, but to know that there's still an empty tomb today is the truth that our Savior lives. We, we have hope, we have joy, we have peace, we have comfort because of that. Lord, would, would you take this message, and it, it'd be your message, I, I pray that you would empty me and me and fill me with you. That everything that is said is of spirit of truth and not of flesh. As John would say in John 3.30, Lord, may you become greater and greater and I become less and less. We, we don't need to hear from Chris, we don't need to hear from uh, Brady or any of the musicians, God, we need to hear from so would you open our minds and our hearts and our eyes and our ears to what you have to say so that we can leave and truly say we're good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. God, may you receive all the honor and the glory and the praise for what's done. It's in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So, so James dealing with faith and works how they tie together. So if you have your Bibles and you, you want to go to Hebrews 11, 1, we're going to answer this question, what is faith? So Hebrews 11, 1 answers that. It says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. A.W. Tozer says this when dealing with this subject. The purpose of good works isn't to change us or to save us, Rather, it's the demonstration of the change within us. <coughs> and so the, the author of Hebrews writes there and says, Now faith is, I think the first thing we need to understand is that faith is an active word. It, it's not something that, you read there, it doesn't say faith was. It doesn't say faith can be. It says faith is. That's an active word. That means that, that there's something going on inside of you to produce faith. And that faith, as James says here, will produce works. That, that Holy Spirit inside of you. You read Ephesians 2. You didn't even have the faith to believe in him. But he, he gave that to you so you could understand who he is and what he done for you. That he brought you from being dead to being alive. Uh, Ephesians 2 says that, that you were once dead in your trespasses and sins. And then uh, uh, Ephesians 4 says, but God who is rich in mercy has made you alive. Amen. He brought you from being dead and a dirty, rotten sinner to being alive and holy and righteous. God. Not based on anything you did, but by installing that faith in you so that you would believe and understand who he is and what he's done for you. That he would give that to you as a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. But he gave it to you. And the author of Hebrews writes and says that. Now faith is. It's an action word. Your faith does not stop growing the moment that you become a believer. Your faith keeps growing. It keeps being. It keeps acting. It keeps moving. It keeps doing. And James says that faith and works tie together. As A. W. Tozer, so that so that the world would see the change that's within us, because works is a result of your salvation. It's proof of who you say you are, and proof of who God is in your life. So three faiths that James is going to deal with. First one being false faith. Verse fourteen through seventeen. The Bible says this, What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? <coughs> if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, if it, if, in the same way faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead. False faith. Now notice questions in verse 14 that James asks. He says, what good is it to have faith and not have works? See, he, he goes on to address this in the next one, but he, he says, even the devil, even the demons believe. So you encounter a lot of people, when you go and you begin to evangelize, you encounter a lot of people that say this. 
Yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. But then you look at their life, and their life doesn't reflect what they're saying they believe. And that's what James is dealing with here when he says that, that what, what good is it, brothers, if someone says they have faith, but they don't have words? Here, here's what he's saying. Their, their talk doesn't match their walk. And we've talked about this numerous times, but, but, but James is addressing this and saying that there are a lot of people that say they have faith. But here's the kind of faith they got. They got false faith. They got faith that ain't going to get them anywhere. Adrian Rogers would say this, that, that uh, if you pr the prayer you prayed didn't change the life you're living, it isn't going to change the destination you're going. Amen. And there are a lot of people in our churches that have walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, and said they have faith in Jesus, but they've done nothing for the kingdom. That their life does not reflect what they're claiming they believe. Here, here's what I mean. They're, they're doing what the world is doing and looking like the world, but they want to say they believe in Jesus. And James says, no, no, that's not how this works. That they work together. They tie together. That you can't say that you have faith and in your life not have works to back it up. That's not biblical. But our churches are full of people that do it. Our society is full of people that do it. You don't believe me. We got politicians that have lost their minds that they say they believe. And look at the works they're doing. And that's not judgmental, but the Bible says that for us as believers, that when somebody says that they believe, we get to look at the fruit that their life bears. And when their life is bearing fruit that doesn't match up what God's word says, we're called to call them out. It's called accountability, and the church doesn't like that because what we do is say, well, you're judging me. No, I'm not judging you. What I'm doing is telling you that what you're saying you believe in the life you're living doesn't match up and is unbiblical. Amen. Because you're saying you believe, but then your life isn't reflecting. And he gives an example here. He says, if your brother, if a brother or sister comes without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm and eat well. He says, but you don't give them what the body needs. What good is it? Here's what James is saying. You can't just say, well, I have faith and not have works. Because that, that's a pretty hypocritical statement there. I have faith, but then somebody comes to you and they need something, and you won't give them what they need. That, that's, pretty, that's pretty evident that you've got a lot of faith, but you got no works. you got false faith. <coughs> I like to say this, that in your life, if you claim you have faith in Christ and your life hasn't changed, no change, no Christ. Because you won't, meet, you won't read anywhere in the Bible that Jesus encountered someone and they put their faith in them, their life wasn't changed. One of my favorite uh, Bible stories that, that we see this is John 4. Jesus encounters a woman at the well who has been married four times, living with a man that's not her husband. And Jesus tells her all about her life without knowing her. And she says, well, I know that the Messiah is supposed to be coming. Jesus reveals to her who he is. She puts his faith in him. And you read verse, I think it's verse 32 in John 4. And if that's not right, I'm somewhere in that ballpark. But it says this. It says that she dropped her water pot. She went into the city and began telling people about the man that she met. Can I tell you what that's the illustration of? It's the illustration that when you meet Jesus, you drop your old bag of bones, you pick up the new life that he has, and you go and tell others about him. That's works. That because you're changed, because your life has been changed by the only one that can change your life, here's the result. You go and tell people about the change that's happening in you. And if you're not living out what you say you believe, you have false faith. And we see this in Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus is, is talking about when, when he returns and he says that the people come to him and they say, but, but master, but master, we, we've casted out demons in your name. We, we've done these things. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you because you didn't put your faith in me. And because of that, your life didn't reflect it. Faith and works ties together, hand in hand. You want real faith? Then do real works. You, you want people to know that what you say you believe and, and your life lives up to it? Make your talk match your walk. Don't just say you have faith and do nothing with it. 
Listen to me. I said this in our new members class, and I don't mean it mean, but it's going to come out mean. The church is full of enough bench warmers. We don't need any more. What we need is people on the field putting on the uniform because their life has been changed by Jesus. They want the world to know that the results of that is that we do things different. That my life is now revolved around Jesus because he's king of my life. He's Lord of my life. I surrendered to him. And so therefore my life looks different. And if you don't have that, false faith. And James says here in verse 17, in the same way faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Now we can call that false faith. We call it dead faith. Whatever you want to call it. When something's dead, it's dead. You ever seen a deer on the side of the road been hit by a car? It's dead. And the funniest thing, I, I, I laugh at this picture. Somebody back home three or four years ago, they saw a dead deer on the side of the road. They put a get well soon balloon on the side of the road. <laughs> funniest thing. Back to, back to the message. <laughs> 1 John 3, 17, 18 says this. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need, but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? Little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with truth and action. Putting our faith to works. You saw on our, our slideshow, faith that works. That's, that's James's whole point of this book. For mature believers, taking your faith and putting it to work and matching them to be one entity. Because of where your faith is, here's what your life looks like. If you haven't done that, if you're holding on to a prayer and that prayer hasn't changed your life, you've got to ask yourself, where's my faith? If you're holding on to faith for fire insurance to get out of hell free card, you got to ask yourself, where's my faith? Because the church will scare you to death, and they'll say, if you, don't, if you don't trust Jesus, you're going to hell, which is true. So what we'll do, we'll go get a get out of hell free car by walking an aisle, signing a car, getting baptized. And we never want to live a life different. And we're missing out on the life that God has for us. Listen to me. God is not sitting up there with a whole bunch of rules of do's and don'ts, and don't want you to have any fun. I can tell you, I have had more fun, and I almost said funner, just to mess with some of those in here that are grammatically correct. <laughs> I've had more fun serving Jesus than I ever did sitting in a bar. And guess what? The next morning you wake up, you ain't got a headache. <laughs> and you ain't sick as a dog. And you remember what you did. <laughs> I've had more fun serving Jesus than I ever did doing any kind of drugs. I've had more fun serving Jesus and serving Jesus with Jesus' people than I ever did anything else. And that's true. That when you begin to serve Jesus, it is a joy. Now, it ain't easy because you've got to serve a hard head like me. But it is worth it. When you begin to put your faith to works and see God move and see God do things that you never thought were possible, it is amazing to watch. And that is the most joy you'll ever get. And here's, here's the thing. When you begin to serve and you begin to do things and build a ramps with our Baptist men, here's what I've learned too. That you go to somebody's house thinking you're going to be a blessing to them and you walk away being more blessed than you were when you got there. Because they want to sit down and talk with you about their Jesus. We, we had a lady, one last ramp was built, sitting in a wheelchair. Couldn't get out the house. Built her ramp, went and talked to her, and she witnessed to us more than we witnessed to her. And we walked away more blessed. Because we're putting our faith to works. So the first faith he deals with, first type of faith, is false faith. Next one is in verses 18 through 20. Failing faith. Here he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith from my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. 
Verse 20, foolish man, are you willing to, le willing to learn that faith without works is useless? James, James says it, it is more to this than just saying you believe. F failing faith. This idea that, that, that we can just say we believe and maybe do a little bit of works and that'd be good enough. J James says it, this, this Christian walk, being a believer, is more than just saying you believe because he says even the devil, even the demons believe. That they know who Jesus is. You go, you go back to Matthew eight. This is proof in Matthew twenty, Matthew eight twenty nine. As Jesus cast out the demon of uh, the of the possessed man, they ask the question. They say, "Son of man," or, or depending on translation, they may even say, "Son of God." What do you want from us? Or what do you want of us? They know who he is. They know the power that he has. They know that he came to change lives. They know that he came as a sinless, spotless lamb of God that would go and be sacrificed. They knew who he was. And in that verse, he, he cast those pigs into, or cast those demons into the herd of pigs. Get this, the devil will learn love for nothing more than for you to think that you're saved because you have a lot of head knowledge of who Jesus is. Here he's, he's talking about having just that head knowledge of who Jesus is, Jesus' identity, and that's what you're going to ride with for your life. And that is not what the Christian walk is about. It's not about just having a bunch of head knowledge. It's about having a relationship with him and him becoming Lord of your life and him changing your life. Amen. To look different. So that when you begin to witness to people, you can share your story and say, hey, I was at A, and now I'm at M, and when I die, I'm going to be at Z. That, that because of when I put my faith in Jesus, here's what my life was, that I was once dead in my trespass and sin, but then I met Jesus, and I became alive, and I realized how dirty and rotten I truly am, and how holy and righteous God really is, and he changed my life to look more and more like him every single day. Now, am I going to fail? Absolutely. But here's what I get. I get to get up and dust it off and ask for forgiveness and keep trucking along. That's the Christian life. That's the Christian walk. That's what people want to see. They don't want to see a bunch of head knowledge. They don't want to hear you quote Bible verses and, and speak Christianese. What they want is to see a life that has truly been changed because then they can say there's something different about them that I don't have, that I want, that I know I need because they have something that when they're in the middle of a storm, they can find joy, they can find peace, they can witness to their doctors. How is that possible? Because they're putting their faith to work. <clears throat> They're experiencing true, mature Christian walk. That faith and works tie together. That it is more than just head knowledge. This faith that um, James is talking about here is head knowledge and emotions. And we're going through, through a season. The church is really going through this season of, of emotions. We're getting away from what the Bible says and we're getting based on people's opinions. Well, I really don't think that's what that scripture means. I, I've heard that. Well, God is love and he really didn't mean that. Alone. When God wrote it, he meant it. When God spoke it, he meant it. When God said it, he meant it. He didn't mean for your emotions and your thoughts and you think you know better than God to come along and say, well, that, that's a little bit, that's, that's not what he meant. Yes, it is. He's a holy and righteous God and knows a lot better than we do. Isaiah 55, we quote this a lot in our Sunday school class, but it's a good reminder. Isaiah 55, uh, 8 and 9, that his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are better than our thoughts. That he knows what he's doing and we don't. And it really don't matter how we feel about it. Because he didn't ask for your emotions to be part of what he wrote. And he really doesn't care if it hurts your feelings. Because he's more concerned about you being holy than you being happy. 
He's more concerned with you walking a wall that points people to him than he is anything else. He's more concerned with you reflecting him than your opinions and your emotions and your thoughts and what you think the Bible should say. That's failing faith and that is crippling the church right now. Emotions leading us instead of him leading us. Head knowledge, well, you know, we've gotten really, really smart and we've got a lot of commentaries and, and, and we go back and that's not really what that scripture means. Yeah, yeah, it is. <coughs> we can be so smart we're dumb. You can go get your doctor degree and still not have any common sense. Because you know some of the people I'm talking about. They're the same people that I talk about and get behind. The speed limit says 45 and they want to go 35. Same people. <laughs> they got their doctor degree, but they can't read speed limit sign. <laughs> it's a failing faith. All right, third faith that we're going to look at here in verse 21 through 26. It's fulfilling faith. James is saying, this is what you want. As a believer in your life, this is the faith you have. Warren Wiersbe says this as we, we jump into these verses. His justification is an important doctrine in, in the Bible. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous on the basis of Christ's finished work on the cross. It is not a process. It is an act. It is not something the sinner does. It is something that God does for the sinner when he trusts Christ. It's a once-for-all event, and it never changes. Because he, he's going to use two examples from the Old Testament. He's going to talk about Abram, and he's going to talk about Rahab. And how they had faith, and they put their faith to works, and it changed everything. Fulfilling faith. So verse 21. He says, wasn't it Abram? Our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, on, uh, his son, on the altar. You see, that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. So the scripture was filled that says, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. He, he's, he's using Hebrews 11 and taking two characters out of the hall of faith and saying, that when we live our life and our life reflects what we say we believe when we put our faith to works, that the world changes, that people begin to see this. And we can look to people and say that's an example of fulfilling faith. Abram here would take his son Isaac and would go up on the mountaintop. No goat to sacrifice. No, no, no lamb. You know the story in Genesis. He, he would go up to the top of the mountaintop. He would build an altar. He would lay Isaac down because God told him to. He's putting his faith into action. Fulfilling faith. And here it says, it wasn't Abram, our father, justified by works. Again, that, that definition of, of justification is an act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous on the basis of Christ's finished work on the cross. Abram was willing to sacrifice Isaac out of obedience to God. For Romans 5, 4, 1 and 5, Paul says that Abram was justified because he believed God. <coughs> Here James is saying that because Abram, Abraham believed God, he did what God told him to do. You see the connection of faith and works? Because he believed God and had faith in him. When God said, hey, take your son Isaac and go up on a mountaintop, and, and that's really hard to do, but Abram was obedient because he was putting his faith in works because he knew who God was and what God did for him and how much God loved him, how much God cared for him. He was obedient even if it was going to cost him. Faith and works tied together. And here James says, because of that, he was justified. Justification is the first step in salvation. If you want to put it in simple terms, as I have to do, live by kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Okay? 
justification, when you look at it, is just as if I didn't do it. That when God looks upon you, he doesn't see you guilty anymore because of Christ's finished work on the cross. That he sees you not guilty because the blood of Christ has been applied. And here he says that when we get that faith and we understand that, that when we put our works and together and when we live our life that is reflecting our faith, that's a feeling faith. That's when you really find the joy of serving Jesus, others, and putting yourself last. That's when you really begin to grow in your walk with Christ. When you understand who he is and what he's called you to do and you put those two things together, the world around you begins to change. And your life begins to change. Because now you're living what you say you believe. And your life backs it up. <clears throat> faith and works tying together. The study Bible says this, true faith always results in good deeds. But the deeds do not justify us. Faith brings salvation. Active obedience demonstrates that our faith is genuine. He uses the example Rahab here in verse 25. He says, and in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute or the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out on by a different route? Rahab in Joshua 2, uh, verse 4, verse 6, and verse 15. Rahab heard all about Israel's God and all that he had done, and she believed. Because she believed, she hid the spies and kept them safe. And because of that, her family was saved. Because she heard, because she believed, here's what she did with her life. And guess what? Her family was saved because of it. Here, verse 26, James says this, But just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. That you can't have one and not have the other. That they go hand in hand. Because of who your faith is in, your life is going to back it up. And if it's not, you got to ask yourself, where's my faith who's it in because if it's in Jesus he wants to take your life and change it and he wants to use you for his good and his glory Ephesians 2 10 we are his workmanship Matthew 5 and Brady just saying that, that because of this change because of us putting our faith in him that we become a light and that we do good work, not to glorify ourselves so that others can see the, that we are trying to glorify our Father and that they will point all back to Him. That because of where our faith is and that we have it now, here's what we do. We go light our candle and we go into a dark and dying world and we tell them about Jesus and how Jesus has changed our life. It's faith and works together to make fulfilling faith. And some of us in this room were missing out on fulfilling faith because we won't put any works to our faith. Because we're holding on to a get out of hell free card or we're holding on to a prayer that we prayed at BBS back in 1967. <coughs> and it's just the truth. And can I tell you this, if you're holding on to a prayer you're praying and when you die, if that's all you got, you're going to bust hell, get hell's gate wide open. we talked about this morning that, that when you stand before Jesus he's going to ask you what you did with the life that you, he gave you that you had opportunities to make him known you had opportunities to, 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 to express his love to others you had opportunities to share his grace and his mercy and in Matthew 25 you read that and, and the two that did it he said well done a good and faithful servant the other one that didn't that just said well I have faith and that's all I got you know what he said to him Get this evil, lazy servant out of, out of my face and cast him into the pits of hell. That for us to live a fulfilling, faithful life, here's what must happen. Our faith and our works must go together. Because of who and where our faith is at, here is the results. My life has been changed by Jesus, and I want the world to know. And so I'm going to do all I can 
not to earn salvation, but because of salvation. This is why I do what I do. I don't do it to bring any glory to me. I don't do it to bring any glory to our church. I don't do it to even talk about me. I do it to point others to him. And James says that that is fulfilling faith. Putting our faith and our works to God. So as we close, I just ask you to ask yourself some of these questions. A heart-to-heart conversation with yourself of where you are. Has there been a change in my life? Do I maintain good works or are my works occasional and weak? Do I seek to grow in things of the Lord? And can tell others tell that I have been with Jesus? You read the apostles in Acts, and because of their faith, they go out, they're preaching the gospel, they're growing the church, they're doing things. And in and, and Acts, there's a, I think it's Acts 17, they, they go to, to, uh, to somebody's house, and I'll remember the name as soon as I get down. And the response of the Roman soldiers at that time was this These men have turned the world upside down. And it's because they're taking their faith and they're putting their works to their faith and, and it makes a difference. Church, it's time for the church to take where they, where, they, where they say their faith is and put it with the works and begin to show people that this is fulfilling faith. This is what it means to be a mature believer. That because of that, this is why we do what we do here at EBC. So, main question on the table. Where's your faith at? Who's your faith in? Then does your life flow? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. Lord, that your word is clear. Lord, there, there's, there's not great areas. There's not areas that we can say, well, what about this? Your word is clear here. The faith without works is dead. We can't have one and not the other. They go hand in hand. And Lord, because of where our faith is, you, you call us to do works for you. So I, I pray for the one who may be here this morning that can't answer that question. Of who's their faith in? Where their faith is? Or maybe something that was said, maybe something that was sung, God, maybe, maybe it's just being here. It's your Holy Spirit begin to convict them. Point them to the truth of your word. Or maybe, maybe, maybe the person sitting in here that their works used to really show their faith and they've, they've just gotten off track and they've gotten busy with life. Lord, you convict them to get back on track. Not, again, not, not to point or, or give us any glory or any credit. We don't want it. But to point others to you and say, because of who my faith is in, my life is different. Or whatever it may be, if you have your will and your way during this invitation, when we get out of the way, when we quit wrestling with you, with going back and forth. There's somebody here this morning is, is sitting on the fence of, of surrender. Your Holy Spirit has been on them and on them and on them. They're running. Lord, we, would today be the day? They stop running. <coughs> surrender to you. Or whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. Would you have your will in your way? In your name we pray.
Would you stand with us? We're going in first. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Just as I am, hymn number 307, it's our invitation hymn, and won't you respond as we sing hymn number 307. Michigan, so uh, kind of sharing how, how we got here uh, very quickly. Uh, so VBS of 2021, right? Yes. Car Carlos, keep me up to date. Um, we, we were in here and we had a video of um, just talking about the North American Mission Board and, and SEND cities, S-E-N-D, and Detroit, Michigan is a SEND city. Um, so inside, it, on, inside Detroit and outside Detroit, um, they don't have many evangelical churches. It's not like here where you got a church on every corner um, because somebody got mad and they went and started a church down the road. <laughs> they, they don't have that. They don't have many churches. Um, so we, we kind of had already been talking about partnering with the North American Mission Board Church and praying about where. Uh, and so we got to talk in and we already had some connections to uh, Pastor Seth Springs. So if you remember, uh, he was supposed to come preach for us, and it snowed just about every weekend there for a while. Um, so he come and share his story, and we just felt like uh, that's where God was sending us to for longevity. So we've been to New York, we've been to New Orleans, but when you go to those places and you partner with churches, it doesn't benefit them to blow in and blow out. Longevity benefits them. Longevity relationships, longevity uh, building with them, walking with them, partnership, being a sister church. Um, so that's what we're aiming for here. So Transformation Church Waterford uh, is where we'll be going and partnering with. Uh, it's about 50 minutes outside Detroit. Uh, it's a blue-collar small town. Um, so we'll be doing some evangelism. We'll be helping them. Uh, so in this process of the year, um, they hadn't, haven't had a permanent spot they've been meeting at. They've been meeting at a school. Um, so a lot of tearing down, a lot of, you know, getting there early, setting up, and they got to tear down everything. Uh, so within a year, uh, they had a church that was down the road from them um, that no longer meets, uh, has a facility. So first approach, they said, hey, we'll sell you a building for 450000 They said, well, we can't afford that. Six months later, they come back and they say, hey, we want to sell you this church for 150000 and they were like, amen, yes. 
Um, so our job this week will be the last crew coming in for the summer. Uh, we'll be going in and helping them get ready for service. So their plan is to be there permanently and to launch um, on Labor Day weekend, I believe. So we're the last team to come in and do some painting. Uh, so pray for Chris, because Chris don't paint. Uh, but I'm going to do what the Lord has called me to do with a smile on my face and a hum in my heart. Uh, so, uh, but we'll do that. And we'll, like I said, we'll do some uh, evangelizing. So we're leaving out Wednesday morning at 530, meeting here. Uh, so be praying for safe travels and we'll be back late Sunday night. Uh, so be praying for Ryan as he will prepare, prepare to preach Sunday. Um, so, and I'll be preaching there. So we're looking forward to being there and worshiping with them. So this is our good looking team that's going with us. And uh, we want to commission them and pray for them. Um, so I'm asking them to stay up here uh, when service ends. If you want to come up and pray with them individually, come talk to them, give, give them a hug, whatever you like to do. Uh, like we did our Ecuador team, we'll leave them up here. And, uh, and pray for them. So we're going to commission them now. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, uh, God, for the opportunities you have given us to go and to be the hands and feet of you. Uh, God, we pray for uh, doors to already be open for conversations. Uh, Lord, uh, you've been planting seeds, and hopefully we get to come along and water them and, and plant new seeds. God, we pray for safe travels for this team. Uh, God, uh, you would just allow us to be flexible. Lord, whatever may come, whatever may happen, uh, may you receive all the honor and the glory and praise. God, we're thankful for our, our church, our family praying for us, uh, sending us and trusting us uh, to go and to share the gospel. Lord, and uh, thank you for opening doors for us to, to partner with Transformation Church in Waterford. God, we pray for them and, and their ministries and uh, all they have going on. Uh, God, that everything uh, would point back to you. Uh, Lord, and as they say, God, that that we would see lives transformed by the gospel. Yes. Lord, that, that is what uh, this is all about. That's what this church is all about. It's about what walking with you is about. It's transformed lives being used for your good and your glory. And so, God, we, we give you our trip. Uh, just pray that you would uh, lead God and direct us. Uh, God, that we work together. Uh, God, we, we would keep the main thing the main thing. Mm -hmm. And Lord, you, may you, again, receive all the honor and the glory and the praise. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And then one other prayer request we have. Uh, Renee has shared with me that uh, many of you know that Littleton Academy, a uh, little school down here, is starting up. And they're starting Tuesday. So be in prayer for them. And be in prayer for all of our uh, students and teachers. As they're preparing to go back. Uh, we'll have a, a time where we pray over them in the next few weeks. But, uh, but especially be in prayer for that school as it starts up Tuesday. And, uh, and be honoring, uh, be praying for them for a good year and that everything will go smooth. So uh, Howard has our closing prayer at the back and then we'll close with songs. Let's stand. Oh Lord, our Father, we want to thank you so much for this message you've given us today. Thank you for ministering us and preparing us for the week ahead. Lord, we ask that that you put people in front of us that we might share the message with. But we need to start each day in prayer, Lord, in prayer that, that when we meet these people you put before us, that, that the Holy Spirit will prepare us with the words to say, that we will step aside and let you speak through us, Lord. That we do so with the desire to glorify your name and to let you seek the rewards, not us. For we know we don't offer salvation. It can only be found through your son, Jesus Christ. Be with us this week, Lord, so we remain faithful and diligent and, and be the servants that you would have us to be. For us in your precious and holy son's name, we thank and pray. Amen.